Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. I hope this uh, podcast finds you healthy and uh, secure. Um, I've been scanning through and rereading parts of various sutras, trying to consider what would be most useful for we, for us to talk about. And what came to me this morning is that I haven't discussed uh, the ten worlds or life conditions in quite a long time. And I thought, you know, um, that might actually be uh, more interesting done as ten separate podcasts focusing on each one of the uh, worlds, as it were. Um, and this is always a difficult decision because the ten worlds are really the hundred worlds because the ten worlds have each of the other ten infused in them. And you'll understand, not infused, but they share momentary experience and thus starts our discussion on life condition so uh, here we go we're gonna start with hell we're gonna talk about the others because we can't not talk about the others uh, wonderful use of a double negative there hell hell there's a word we read when we read translations of uh, Buddhist texts, sermons. No matter whose translation, we're confronted with a myriad number of hells. Some that pop up all the time: the hell of incessant suffering. We've seen that one a lot. The Avicii hell, right? Um, this concept of hell follows us from Vedic times. I mean, 12,000 years of, of different ideas. Um, there are the hot hells, the cold hells. There's the neighboring hells. And there's a, it, it just there's no end to hells. Um, in in uh, the Ten Worlds, we simply name the hell uh, jigaku and it's kind of a an umbrella term for all of these different hells there's a couple of important things to consider to, to keep in mind as you're studying and you know, reading different sutras and whenever you see this word hell I would advise you not to get so hung up on the descriptors, the cold hell, the hot hell, the Avicii hell, the incessant suffering hell, the, the this hell, the that hell, the hell. Hell, conceptually, and this is why this series I'm calling Life Condition. Hell is that moment that you may not even stay in more than a fraction of a second. As you migrate, transmigrate, transmutate your mental energies toward other 
life conditions. Just to give you an idea, there's the reviving hell, the black line hell, the rounding up and crushing hell, the howling hell, great howling hell, heating hell, intense hell, heating hell, hell of ultimate torment. There's also the 18 hells and hell beings. Um, in Japanese, Hachinetsu Jigoku, as I said earlier. Also the eight great hells or the eight major hells, the realms of suffering said to lie beneath the uh, the ground of Jampud, that's the other thing. These hells all have characteristics. They're hells uh, that are boundless or that they're great walls you can't surmount. Um, the cold hells, uh, hell of blisters, burst blisters, clenched, chattering teeth, lamentations, groans, utpala like cracks, lotus like cracks, great lotus like cracks. Um, that's as much as I want to talk about the naming because I wanted to get your imagination running around about, gosh, there are different types of hells that we experience. Remember, Buddhism is about the mind. So it's about how we experience samsara. Again, this is what Buddhism is about, living this life well. So Buddhism spends a lot of time dissecting the way the mind works. And the ten worlds, the ten, Jikaku through Bodhisattva, or, and, and of course Buddhahood, are ten segments of perception that we can easily reference. And then to complicate matters, really, uh, to lend more insight into the matters, is we list those same concepts once again, and we understand that each of those ten has the other ten as subcategories within them. So, for example, you can be in the hell of Buddhahood, believe it or not. You can be in the learning and realization of the world of Nin or tranquility or humanity it has different names depending on whose definition you read. Or you can be in the hunger of all the others. They, they intermix and pollinate each other constantly. And this is the point, and this is why I want to have this discussion. We get hung up on the words. Well, animality, that's why we act like animals. Well, yes and no. Um, what about the animality of animality? Ooh, how animal are you there? So I think a broader discussion is necessary. And we need to understand all of these under the life conditions rubric. Our life conditions change as I've explained, life is a moment-to-moment -moment birth, death, birth, death, birth, death, which means that birth is a reinstantiation. And in that reinstantiation, the life conditions that your mental attributes, your mental reasoning, your mental cognition, your nine consciousnesses, so we need to add that into these 10 realms that are within each other. Our kinetically moving, right? Influencing the next moment, which is influenced and influencing. And then there's this constant re-existing transmutation of our minds. Our bodies are doing the same thing without our consciously thinking about it. Our bodies are constantly replacing cells, making new ones, programming them. Need a liver cell. Slough that one off. Body's busy doing all of that in a consciousness that you're not even cognitive of, right?
But as far as our experiential mind is concerned, we have these 3,000 realms that we mutate, migrate, transmigrate through every single moment. In many ways, you could define that, that as the very thing that we call life. Is this transmigrating momentum of energies that are formations of these conditions. These life conditions. Do you see? So, what if you're in a classroom and uh, you're a good student you're paying attention and the teacher's talking about uh, last night's homework and out of the blue as she's talking and you know how you do when the teacher's talking sometimes you're paying full attention to every word but a lot of times you're looking at your notes and you're hearing rum, 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 like the peanuts gang right when when the adult talks wah, 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 wah. You, you're paying attention but you're not listening to every word and suddenly you hear your name called out panic <laughs> what 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 you just went through a thousand different life conditions there's that shock where you may be in one of the hells, totally unexpected, jarring. Afraid. And then immediately trying to regain your footing. Well, that's not hell anymore. That's that may be hell, but it's the maybe the learning and realization of hell or just the realization that something is occurring, that you need to call forth your attention, that you need to be present. And so learning is right there on the heels of realization because this is about learning. You're in a classroom. Hard to get back to nin and tranquil. Things are happening. Right? This is how we travel through the worlds, right? But that instant, you had an instant of hell, some kind of a hell. It wasn't a depressive hell. It was a shock to your system hell. It was a equilibrium hell. You see how we can put all these adjectives onto hell? There's just, it's hell is a place you don't want to be for long. Hell also includes depression. Now, depression is a serious thing. We all get down. But as you know, if you go to the doctor and somebody's asked you, have you ever been depressed? Most of us would say, yeah, I felt like shit the other day, you know? But the doctor means, have you been clinically diagnosed as depressed? If you've ever been there, I, my heart, I feel for you. But if you haven't been there, those people are experiencing a degree of self-destructive thoughts that are very overwhelming. But even then, to come up with the idea of slitting one's wrist or, and I know I'm going to get a little graphic here, but really, let's talk about hell. How in hell are you? Because people who are ready to harm themselves are not just in hell. They're in a specific hell, right? They're in a hell that's self-destructive. There's an aspect of animality to that, of superiority and inferiority. Hell is, a, is a, an emotive... Uh, experiential state that's just feels inescapable, stuck, cornered. Right? And when the 
teacher calls your name, that's kind of, you could use those words to describe that moment of, ah, you're cornered. But you don't stay there long. However, if you're depressed, you might wallow there a little longer. But part of that wallowing and the way you experience that hell is joined by hunger, animality, anger, right? How many times have you been depressed where you can't get your mind to stop beating yourself up? Why did you say those things? Why the hell did I even go there? Why did I respond to that idiot? Blah, 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 blah. Right? That may seem like hell, and yes, you're experiencing hell, but hell is just that one component. All that other stuff, that self-blaming, you know, that's animality. And maybe hunger, maybe there's part of you that's in insatiably desiring that A grade or that attention from the beautiful teacher or the, any form of those, or you want to show off right you're migrating through all of these different worlds constantly at a rate you can't even and they stick together it's like a recipe like you're baking your life condition we're never solely in one life condition that's even if you're fully enlightened buddha Buddha has hell, hunger, animality, humanity, um, anger, and, and uh, learning and realization in it. It's just that from a Buddha point of view, they don't influence you. You simply see them. You observe those life conditions. And of course, our goal, the 10th degree of Bodhisattva, is to be in the Buddha of Buddha. To simply not experience any of those. But you're still in a compounded state. As long as you're in samsara. And when you're not in samsara, there is no state. Do you see? This is why we know. Because... All of these states of being, all of these experiences are only available to us when this mind is available to us. And when this mind is available to us, only when this body supports its instantiation. When you're not in samsara, when you're not in the universe of life creation, instantiation, then there's no mind there's no life condition. So what is the hell of incessant suffering? Because it's prefaced by the word hell, we immediately, especially as Westerners, think of a place. What's that place? And that's what even Buddhist literature describes the place. It's this far down underground. It has these walls. It has... Uh, it's a burning hell, so there's constant fire, and you never completely burn up, but you're always on fire. You know, they have dramatic um, descriptions of these hells, but they are not places. They are experiences. You ever do something maybe just stupid because you weren't paying attention and and something happened and maybe you were working on a barbecue and you, and you got something going you started playing in the embers and one of those coals unknown to your you know excitement flew over and landed in uh, uh, on somebody and uh, started burning them and they caught on fire and uh, oh my god could you imagine the the drama and the and the excitement and the craziness and how bad would you feel? That's a hell. That's a hell that would be hard for you to escape. 
Because as long as that person is injured and people remind you of what happened, even long after that person has healed, hopefully, you'll never forget that experience. In fact, even if you do think you forget that experience, the moment you go to somebody's house for a get together and they say, let's barbecue some fish. You're, <laughs> you don't think you're going to remember that. <laughs> That's incessant. The hell of incessant suffering is something we carry in our life experience all the time. It's just that we're not always buried within it. We have all these other life conditions, these 3,000 realms we're always going through. And the, so that hell would diminish while we spend time over here in these other life states. But that's why it's called the incessant hell of pain and suffering. Because it's a integral part of samsara. And that's the larger point I want to make here. Life conditions, the ten worlds, the ten, the mutual possession of the ten worlds. Right? Throughout the three existences and the thousand realms, the three thousand realms in a single thought moment. It's no accident that it's called that long name. Sometimes called the 3,000 realms in a single thought moment of life or a single moment of life, but it's a thought moment. It's an experiential thing. And some of those hells, like the teacher calling your name, you may revisit that feeling again and again throughout your life, but it'll be a renewed experience of that hell. Whereas an incessant hell indicates samsaric human existence, the, this life form where we do experience has within it an incessant hell. So, Hell isn't a place, hell isn't permanent, and hell isn't a condition we're always in. But it does color our myriad 3,000 realms of experience within each moment of life, thought moment. Does it make sense? Sometimes hell is just you can't find your keys. And sometimes you're sick and not finding your keys and it makes you really mad and you burst out a yell or you kick something. Well, that's rage, but that's also hell, but it's a different form of hell, right? It's a destructive thing. Hell, that's the one defining feature of hell. The experience of hell is it tends to be destructive of your life condition, certainly of your happiness. And that's what I want to end on with hell, is that all these life conditions stand as definitions of mental conditions within our samsaric lifespan in relation to awakening, enlightenment, Buddhahood. They're tools to help understand our attachments, our emotions, our perceptive filters, why am I thinking this way? Oh, I'm spending too much time in that experience. 
in that experience of hell, hunger, animality, so on and so forth. I Boy, I want to go into these other life conditions, but today's lesson, today's talk is about hell and the many forms it takes and how it never really takes complete hold. There's always a mixture of other life conditions. And while I'm at it, when uh, Buddhism speaks of uh, the six lower life conditions or the six lower worlds or the three lower worlds, it's identifying a home base. What do I mean by a home base? Consider someone who's never heard about Buddhism or the Ten Worlds. They're just happily going along their life. They have moments of sadness. They have moments of rage. They have moments of uh, animality on the freeway. They have moments of uh, calm and reflection. They have moments of, uh, of um, you know, getting called upon by the teacher. <laughs> you know, they have... Uh, Moments where they're learning and they get aha moments. All of these worlds belong to the spectrum of human life. They are just the, in Buddhist terms, the ordinary or ignorant humans. They're not ignorant because they're stupid. They're ignorant because they are ignorant of bodhisattva and Buddhahood. And some may actually do really good deeds for others. But Buddhism would argue that that doesn't make them a bodhisattva. That just makes them doing good acts of humanity to one another. And maybe they're driven by several other worlds mixing together. Maybe their generosity is genuine but it also is driven by politic the way they look acceptance maybe they're just hungry to for love they want to be loved by offering something that for them is easy to offer right that's why these big generous donations by people are usually by people who don't feel the impact of that donation other than what they receive back in return. They're buying attention, they're buying acceptance, or they're buying power and influence, manipulation, world of anger. Or they just want to help somebody, just subsist or appear to be helping somebody. We fool ourselves a lot, too, especially with means of, uh, uh, of uh, wealth or, or um, what's the word I'm looking for? Anyway, to be a bodhisattva is specifically to help somebody else attain their Buddhahood. That's very specific. Bodhisattva isn't just a, a teacher does many kind of, wonderful things helping to raise students and their awareness in their minds. But that doesn't make them bodhisattvas. That makes them facilitators, assistants to life, but not enlightenment. They don't confuse the two. That's not to say that there aren't some wonderful teachers out there. Certainly there are. And, but what their motivations are is samsarically based. So is everything you might say. Yeah. So is Buddhahood. You can't achieve Buddhahood outside of samsara. But the goal, the training, the understanding of Buddhahood is absolutely necessary for a person of 
whatever life states to then be considered a bodhisattva. The bodhisattva, simply put, is a human entity that's traveling the world through time with this Buddha way, with this enlightenment way. Because Buddha is a mental condition. Buddha doesn't walk around. The only thing that walks around that can transmit, communicate, and facilitate this Buddha mind, this Buddha life condition, is a bodhisattva. So the bodhisattva has to know Buddhahood in order to be able to facilitate others coming to it. And you say, well, I just started Buddhism. You know, I've been doing this a year already. And, you know, there's, how am I going to help other people? I'll, yeah, I don't understand Buddha. I, I, barely, I barely understand it when I chant. But you forget that even within your lower worlds, six worlds that we're all traveling in, that you're migrating in constantly, when you chant, you are invoking your Buddha. And when you chant with others, you are being a bodhisattva, sharing that invocation with their invocation. That is why the understanding of Buddhahood can only be held or understood between Buddhas. So when we chant together, that's actually happening. The communication is there. It may not be oral, well, it's chanting, but it may not be a um, conversation, you know, by the fireside chat of Buddhas talking. But when you chant with others, you are Buddhas talking. And you are being bodhisattvas. That's why chanting with others is, is very powerful. That's why sangha is powerful. Because even though we communicate right now through these words, trying to fumble through, how does this mental thing work? How do we awaken this Buddhahood? We are facilitating each other's motivations, understandings, so that when we do go to mandala and chant, all of this will percolate into our bodhisattva mind, of Buddha way. I'll say it every which way I can so that you can get a mental picture for yourself. But that also means that when you're in, um, you know, um, Nin or, uh, or whatever life states that you, you're, you know, we're never in one. So whatever group of life states you are, even throughout a conversation, you're migrating through all of these, um, If you invite somebody, you know, should come over sometime and try this chanting thing, see what you think. You just went from or within your world of whatever you, worlds you were in communicating and whoop, you just popped in the bodhisattva of those worlds. You may be in the bodhisattva of animality, the bodhisattva of uh, hell. You can be in the bodhisattva of, uh, of course, you'd have to watch your motives, wouldn't you? You could be in anger, for instance, which is a manipulative state. But if you invite somebody to come over and chant with you because you want to manipulate them, then I would argue that your bodhisattva state is being tarnished by that anger world of manipulation. But you might be in the world of manipulation and, and and several others going on as you're having a conversation and suddenly the thought occurs to you, wow, this would all be so much better if I could share what Buddha-ness is with this person. It would totally transform them. And with that thought, see, every single thought, with the, that thought, you said, you should come over and try a chanting. And with their very next uh, words, they might disappoint you, fine. Or they might willingly come along and then you're panicked. What have I done? Because <laughs> you know? we're going through all these worlds. But in that moment, 
if your sentiment was genuine, that you'd like to see what this person would be like, enlightened, what your relationship with them would be like. That's, that's truly your bodhisattva life condition coming out. But you see how there's all these weird little degrees of everything? And the more, you, the more you start to understand how these things all dovetail into each other, the more meaningful I think it will be for you to understand what it is to be, to remain in a Buddha mindset as a bodhisattva human being traveling the world. How different, how jarringly different it would be to live your life moment to moment with the Buddha mind. Then you begin to understand some of these texts that talk about that land, that pure land, that, that land unaffected. See, it's not a different place, but perceptually, it would make the place different. Other way around. All right. I think that was sufficient. So that's the world of hell. Comments below. And uh, I guess the next one will be hunger. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you so much for your patience. You were listening all the way to the end. It makes a big difference uh, on YouTube. Here we go with the YouTube thing again. Like, subscribe, share. Um, and I think this, this 10 Worlds, this series on life conditions, I think might be useful uh, just to instigate a dialogue, to get re-grounded into what we're experiencing, why we chant, how we do this. Um, and I look forward to your comments. Thanks again, my patrons, you guys, awesome, amazing. Those on Patreon and those outside of Patreon, you guys are, are amazing. Thank you. Everyone thanks you. Um, and those of you who are downloading the podcast, cool. I really hope that that's useful for you. Um, I know these can get long and sometimes you can only dedicate so much time. So the podcast allows you to complete and, and listen to the whole thing. So uh, I hope that's helpful for you. Um, and let me know if, if you have suggestions for something I should be talking about. But right now it's the 10 worlds and uh, I will see you in the next one. Take care of your health. Be kind to yourself and others. And I'll see you then. Bye now.